Wonderful. Um, we are a nonprofit accelerator and, uh, and boot camp focused on, on medical XR. Uh, we have uh, quite a few partners in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the field. Um, including um, uh, University Hospital Heidelberg, um, uh, Mass General Brigham, uh, and Boston Children's uh, Hospital, and Northeastern University. Uh, we, um, uh, we teach the inter interdisciplinary art of medical XR innovation. Uh, we precipitate new medical XR prototypes and accelerate viable uh, projects. Uh, and we uh, promote the innovator's journey with uh, webinars uh, like, uh, like this. Um, uh, you can uh, stay in touch with us via our, our, our website. Um, since we are growing, we brought on uh, two more executive board members uh, that we're really pleased about because they're very, very accomplished people. Uh, Jennifer Silva uh, has um, started two companies in the medical XR field. Uh, and Giorgio Natili has um, uh, been involved in uh, uh, every um, uh, cycle of technology change going back to, um, uh, to, to the very nascent uh, uh, internet. Uh, so they're, they're wonderful advisors and, uh, and accomplished um, uh, innovators and, and, um, and, and managers. Uh, today, um, uh, we uh, have a, um, a talk on wellness and, and therapeutic VR. Um, I think VR has been misassociated uh, with games and entertainment when it's uh, really a, a serious field where uh, we can do good for, uh, for, for patients uh, and uh, improve the efficiency of, um, uh, of, of healthcare and also have uh, sustaining business models. Um, we um, asked Denise Sil Silver of, of VR Health to, um, uh, to help to put together the panel and to run it uh, because she's been curating uh, eHealth and uh, XR uh, Health for over, over a decade uh, based upon efficacy and, um, uh, and commercial sustainability. Uh, so uh, she's uh, uh, the, the right place to, uh, uh, to go to, to focus in on, on uh, some, some of the, the more interesting applications of, of XR in this area. Um, she, um, uh, she's a HBS alumni uh, and it also is in the leadership of uh, Harvard, um, uh, the Harvard Club in, in France. And on that note, I'm going to stop, uh, stop presenting and turn things over to Denise uh, and uh, uh, we can get into the subject matter. Well, th thank you so much, Steve, and to your organization for inviting me to put together um, this group. We have um, some amazing managers from three award-winning companies here, and I'm just going to quickly uh, mention their names before I go further in the, uh, in the introduction. So we have um, Caitlin Krauss uh, from TRIP, we have Jessica Maslin from Myron, and we have Vina Somaretti from Neuro Rehab VR. These three companies are uh, companies that are not very old at all. They're between uh, four and six years old, and they're representing a really burgeoning field, which I'm very excited to know some information about and to pass it on to you. Um, so here's the quiz question. If, if you were to wonder how many VR trials there are right now on clinicaltrials.gov, you're not allowed to look, which um, is an international uh, listing of clinical trials. Well, the answer would be 1,833. And about a year ago when I looked at it, it was under 1,200. Now, another fascinating thing, since I am based in Europe, is that the two big players in this are the US and Europe at equal numbers, equal numbers. And together they represent more than two thirds of this, uh, of this area. And then if we look into what's going on in terms of the conditions being studied, the way that clinicaltrials.gov sets it up, they're counting between eight and 900 different use cases. Now, a lot of them might be just rewordings of similar things, but if we try and, simplify that, 
then we'd be looking at pain, rehabilitation, anxiety, and wellness. So in terms of the number of trials going on, that's the order. The most are in pain, followed by rehabilitation, followed by anxiety and wellness. That goes from 417 down to 81. And if we look at publications, that's not the order at all. Um, the number, and some of these can be duplicates, the number of publications in the past 10 years, the greatest is wellness. That is uh, followed very closely by uh, rehabilitation uh, and then anxiety and then pain. So these are the main areas that we'll be looking at. And the reason I'm so interested in that is that I'm representing today vrforhealth.com, which is a co-founded company along with Beth Savildelli, who is a former patient who, like myself, was hoping that we could get VR into the hands of more people. And so I'm proud to say that thanks to the partnerships we're developing and the communication that we're doing with companies like the three I mentioned, we are getting the word out more, not just these three, but um, another 27 or so. So I'm going to start, and she knows that, we're starting with wellness, with uh, Trip Incorporated's representative, who's the chief wellness officer, Caitlin Kraus. We know that Trip is very strong in bringing science uh, to the area of mental wellness, to having better mental focus and to productivity. So I've asked Caitlin and the others to explain who they are, how they got to this position. For those of you who are looking to enter into the industry as well, that's of use. And to explain all the good things that your company does and the challenges that, that you've uh, overcome and all the science that you bring to bear for the quality of the future of VR. So Caitlin. This is great, Denise. Thank you so much. And even though we're not gamifying it, I've heard that I have seven minutes to do all of that. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's the game and the challenge. And just hello to everybody. I see some um, some comments in the chat from friends and colleagues and people that, you know, I feel like we're all connected. And that's what I really love about getting on these panels and learning from each other. Um, yeah, so I, I came on board at TRIP as chief wellness officer and really believe in pioneering wellness technologies across XR. So thinking beyond uh, one device, because we know that the headsets update, the technology is always changing. Uh, what I love about TRIP is that there are mobile applications, there's AR technology, we partner with Niantic, um, a lot of different augmentations, and then there's also the VR applications. And um, inside of virtual reality, there are experiences that you could have as standalone for wellness and for things that are calm and meditative and also for focus. Um, so having those standalone experiences are kind of like on demand. And then part of my background, people who know me in the XR VR world, I've been hosting a lot of live sessions over the years. So my path to discover trip really came from being out there in the field and developing a lot of interactive um, mindfulness experiences, storytelling exercises, getting bunches of people together in metaverse in ways where they're sharing objects and um, doing work with memory palaces. And um, because I was doing a lot of those shared experiences, Nenea Reeves, the founder of Trip, we ended up becoming friends a number of years ago and we were side by side, you know, just working on pioneering the technology and uh, decided to team up. So when I came on board as chief wellness officer, I had already been doing a lot in the field. I also teach at Stanford a course called Digital Wellbeing. And the subtitle of the course is Developing a Healthy Relationship with Technology. And I love this course because it's really a design-inspired course where you take a lot of the medical research and the vetted health protocols, and then you talk about the relationship you have with tech. So I'm often asking people, um, even right now, do we have a sense of panic if we don't know where our um, smartphone is? Like if I asked you, is it in your pocket? Is it on the table in front of you? You know, there are a lot of people who say, gosh, my relationship with everything from um, alerts, notifications, um, sounds that come from technology, it can be, um, 
it can be subtly disruptive to the new types of rituals that we're trying to develop as people have more freedom with when and where and how they work and how they're creative in the world. So the other, the other kind of double meaning of the subtitle is the relationship from human to human that's mediated by tech. So I really love to explore that. So part of my work with Trip is really looking at the user experience and trying to make it um, something that's really high quality and also um, encouraging freedom, encouraging people to feel like they have a creative sense of play, that their um, that their wellness is inspired and supported by the technology, and that um, they don't feel as if um, they've given up any of their human kind of freedoms. You know, it's like our physical bodies should be supported by technology and um, not in a way that creates a dependency. So yes, yeah, so I love bringing in all the research and TRIP is a place that has over 6 million sessions worldwide that people have had. And so there's a lot of data insights. There's a lot that we can do in terms of expanding uh, the quality of the actual um, engagements and working across platform means that sometimes we can focus on live sessions and sometimes we can focus on things people can do by themselves. Yeah, so I think the, the data is really exciting to work with and um, to look at how that can keep improvement. So yeah, another insight I really love is that last month, 32% um, of our users had been using TRIP uh, for over a year. So our monthly active users were actually ones that had stayed with TRIP 32% for over a year. So, you know, focus on longevity. That was one of the pieces um, at Stanford. I work uh, with Jeremy Balenson and he'd been saying to me, there's a lot of VR research, um, but there's not a lot of longevity in the research. So the more we can track over long time periods, that's what I'm really interested in and a combination of quantitative and qualitative. So taking those data points, infusing a lot of storytelling. Um, yeah, that's that's where I'm really animated. So I could go on, I'm time checking. Um, I also really wanna talk with the creative people out there. Um, I went back for my MFA in creative writing and focus on poetry and storytelling. And part of my work um, was with someone in the Harvard Medical School. So my thesis advisor was really working as a medical doctor and talking about the way that story, um, we feel it in the body, even words and stories have a certain amount of uh, therapeutic effect. So yeah, so I really love, that was Rafael Campo, by the way, if you have a chance to read his poetry, it's really wonderful and powerful. Um, I'll, yeah, maybe we can drop that in the chat somewhere. So yeah, I love to infuse story. And I feel like if the world doesn't have a little wonder and delight built into the way that we um, plan our programming, then um, we don't get to feel that emotional uplift. So I'm often asking, where's the wonder? Where's the delight underneath our experience design? And I know that you have the wonder of the forest behind you. The forest That's right, the I brought them with us. This is Belgium. Them with you. Yep. Yes. So um, just letting the audience know that we are seeing your questions. For the moment, it looks like we can't chat back to you, but we do see your questions and they will be included after we get through this first uh, introductions. That was fantastic, Caitlin. There's so much that we can dig into afterwards. So by alphabetical order of last name and Jessica was smart enough to start a company with the same letter as her name. So Jessica Maslin of Myron uh, is going to go next. I, I really love that sentence about bringing virtual reality uh, re rehabilitation after life-changing, if not life-threatening, injury and muscular skeletal disorder. I know you have a fantastic founding story too of the company. So take it away. Yeah, thank you, Denise. Um, coincidentally, Miron and my last name do have the same starting letter, but Miron is actually a combination of the words mirror neurons. And I'll get more into that later, but basically we wanna trick the brain into recognizing new pathways because a lot of people that use the technology that we've created are using it after they've had a spinal cord injury or a brain injury. Um, but you know, it didn't start that way. We had to get to there. 
And, um, you know, Steve said it in the beginning that a lot of times VR is associated with games. And, and that's how I started with VR. Um, about 15 years ago, I was in medical research um, using bone morphogenic protein uh, intraorally. It's a spinal fusion technology, but I was using it in dentistry. And a lot of my responsibilities were in 3D and 360 volumetric capture to make sure that the surgeries that we were doing were successful. How much bone was grown? Um, is the sinus cavity intact? Can you put a dental implant in? And little did I know at that time, 15 years ago, that I would be in VR, where a lot of the same principles of that 3D and 360 imaging are in the backbone of the VR technology itself. But at the time, I uh, gave into my creative side, and I became a partner at a creative agency where I was tasked with finding new ways to engage brand audiences. And in 2015, that's when I found VR. Um, so I did start in that, you know, gaming side, the entertainment side, and we created a lot of really fun activations using the technology, but it is lower hanging fruit. Um, we did the first ever national uh, door buster for Black Friday using VR with Tilly's at 240 of their stores across the country, um, did narrative experiences, did brand experiences with companies like Sperry, which is a traditional boating shoe, but how can we tell stories of the sea and feel like you're there? And it was a really powerful way to connect people in ways that they had never felt emotionally connected to these stories before. You know, like Caitlin was saying, there is so much power in, in hearing these stories and feeling them and having that emotional connection to them. And we did a narrative experience with this artist named Greg Crayola Simpkins, um, for anyone that's into the street art scene, he's part of that Can't Be Stopped crew. That's a group of street artists. They've been around since the 80s. And uh, he, he did this experience with us where he's putting up a mural. He does a lot of very whimsical art. And uh, it was narrated. What inspires him? What is his process for creating these art story pieces? And we captured the whole thing in VR. Um, it was very fun to do. Uh, part of what made it come to fruition was building these rigs on the floor of Home Depot where I had my legal pad and I'm tallying up how many nuts and bolts and different pieces of hardware we're using to make these rigs that didn't exist at the time. Now there's so much consumer um, technology available, which is a huge, huge leap for all of us. And six months later, the artist called our office and he said he had some really sad news. His five-year-old niece was doing a back bend in her living room and in a freak accident had a spinal stroke and became paralyzed from the waist down. But she had seen the VR experience that we had created with Greg, her uncle, and kept saying to her parents, remember when we were back in LA with Uncle Greg and we made that art? And every time they told her, no, Eden, you saw it in VR, she was getting so mad at them because she couldn't understand why her parents were lying to her. In her small, you know, little body, in her impressionable mind, she had been alongside her uncle creating this masterpiece. And she couldn't understand why her parents were hiding that from her, why they weren't, you know, why they couldn't remember being there. You know, now with all the research that exists, we know that you can essentially inception someone, especially if they are impressionable, which is why it's also important to have that quality of control of what is going into these experiences that resonate with people. But at the time, um, I flew out with one of my business partners to Kentucky to where her family had uprooted to and just wanted to see what is her rehab. Her mom said something that really stuck with me that was, if life was just about eating and walking again, it would be so easy. How does she grow into an adult body when the muscles surrounding all of her si internal systems, her digestive system, her bones are all paralyzed? You know, she, when we went out there, she had just started school, kindergarten again. How, if she drops her pen, can she lean over and pick it up without falling out of her wheelchair? You know, the goal is to live as independently as possible, but it takes a lot of practice to do that. And now at five years old, she is in a wheelchair and back to doing exercises that make her feel babyish. So one of the first things that we did when we went out there was tested VR with her. And it wasn't anything that was um, 
that was therapeutic at the time. It was of someone skateboarding in a swimming pool, Christian Hosoik or Vans. And she loved it. She was doing an assisted crawling exercise and she wasn't complaining about the pain. She didn't care about looking like a baby. Um, she was doing it with more prompting, less pain, and her mental health was through the roof. And that was the real aha moment that made us really study these principles of recovery, how to prevent secondary injury, and create a library that serves so much more than just spinal cord injuries. It's also brain injuries, stroke, um, and different musculoskeletal disorders. So it's been quite a journey, and I'm excited to share more with you guys. Thank you, Jessica. It's so tough to do this since it's a real exercise in, in a short period of time. So now let's thank you so much. Let's turn to uh, to Vina, who's um, informa the information, the about about your company is also about providing engaging uh, and enjoyable uh, exercises. So take it away, Vina. How did this start? Thank you, Denise, and thank you, Caitlin and Jessica, for sharing your stories. I think we all have come from a similar background where we, you know, meet with somebody. We, uh, we have this life-changing movement that, you know, helps us create these companies. And I can quickly go through our, our journey, you know, some of the challenges we have had and the solution we have, we have right now. So I'm, like Denise said, I'm Vina, the CEO of Neuro Rehab VR, and Kind of like Jessica, I used to play, you know, I played a lot of games in high school. So first person shooters, uh, uh, Diablo, Doom, like all of my favorite things. And uh, as I started to grow up, I knew that I would go into computer science and I wanted to be a hacker. That was my goal. <laughs> that did not end up happening. But, uh, but I did do computer science and I came to the States for my game design and development because I always still had this passion for creating games. And I know VR always has this thing about starting in games. So I did start there. And then I met my professor that I'm really indebted to for everything I know right now, uh, started working in the virtual reality lab at my school and then started to meet with other people and the kind of my horizons of art where VR can be used really opened up and we did a lot of literature reviews. So uh, that became part of uh, how we started to do things even at the company. We go back and look at all the literature review. So I really like that you're talking about all the clinical trials that are happening and uh, what's happening in the space. because It's really important to know where the technology is at and where we can take it. So while I was working on it, uh, you know, one of my first internships was at Intuitive Surgical that they create you know, VR uh, robotics for surgery. Uh, it's a well-known company and uh, uh, they have a robotic device called Da Vinci. So that kind of opened up my perspective into, oh, virtual reality and my skills can be used in healthcare. And that was the decision point for me. This is where I will stay because most of the jobs that I was getting were in games and creating games, which is amazing too, because I played a lot of games while growing up, but I wanted something that is a little more satisfying to wake up every day and be like, I helped this person with the skills that I have. So that as soon as that happened, I just started to look into what else can we do in healthcare? Came back to school because that was just an internship. And one day got this random email from this one person that said they really want to add virtual reality to the patients at their clinic. And his story is definitely, you know, more powerful because his son, when he was about 18 years old, it's been about seven years now, had a uh, anoxic brain injury. You know, athletic kid, you know, uh, well-rounded and suddenly he's not able to move and as parents they did everything that they can they you know took him to the best hospitals and everybody said there is no hope he will not he'll always be in a wheelchair they did not give up they wanted to use one of these robotic devices that are out there for gait training called the locomat if anybody has heard about it but he's you know because he's a very tall kid and it was hard for physical therapists to get him to move and but the closest one was four hours away from where our company is right now say so they did move but it didn't work out uh there were not many not much progress so they came back and he wanted to buy the device for himself i'm sure that happens to everyone where i'm glad trip is a consumer-based product you know ours is still a b2b and we have a lot of people coming to us for you know our VR solutions, but we've stayed in the B2B and that happens to everyone, I guess, in the medical device space. So what he did was he started a clinic because they would not sell the device to an individual. They could only sell it to a clinic. So he actually started a clinic and it started with one patient uh, there with this really cutting edge robotic device and then realized there were 
so many people right here in Fort Worth that wanted access to the device. And we started to have more physical therapists. That's when he contacted me. And I was always used to creating MVPs for other people with my background in computer science and game design. I By then I had kind of started three companies, I guess, you know, uh, because you always start somewhere and I was just building apps for other people. And then I realized this is something that I can do. Met all the patients, met the clinicians. We started uh, cre- pretty much incubated inside this clinic. We When we started to build these apps, as soon as they put it on, you know, the patients, they saw such a big difference. You know, there's one of the app, the first apps I built was, uh, a, you know, a walking app. So the patients are collecting coins and they know what the distance that they're traveling on a treadmill. And we saw as soon as they put on the headset, they're actually going faster. Uh, and the therapists are like, we, we keep trying to do this every day, but it doesn't happen. But it makes such a big difference. And then we saw a difference in our MS patients, our TBI patients, spinal cord injury, and we were able to build that library of exercises, just like Jessica working with these patients and the ideas mostly came from them. They're like, this is what I want to do. This is my therapy goal. And one of my favorite examples is we had, you know, one patient, her whole goal was to be able to go grocery shopping with her grandkids after, you know, her stroke incident. So like, let's simulate that. You can learn everything in virtual reality and then take that to what you're doing in the real setting. And these patients were also amazing. You know, they can give us critical feedback. So we quickly realized we had to customize it for each person's functional level. And that was something that we discovered very early on. uh, And then we were able to create that intent, increase or decrease the intensity of training in real time. So the therapist has that full control about the patient experience. And then as we started to work on this, like one of the challenges that we went through is uh, making sure that, you know, as we started to talk to hospitals, they wanted to make sure this was an FDA product. And that was one of the biggest challenges that we had to get through. So we we are an FDA registered medical device, a class two device right now. And then when we started to do make these sales to large hospital systems, uh, and I think this is kind of something that the whole VR industry is trying to figure out is retention making sure that the therapist actually picks up that headset every day to use it with that patient. And so we had to, one of the things we had to do was bring down that setup time, make sure it's very easy to use. And it's just pretty much as taking the headset, put on the patient and go and nothing else that's more uh, involving more than that. And it took us a long time to get to that point. And I'm happy to say, I think we have now. And in the last few months, I've seen the the usage rates increase by more than 100% after making these quality of life changes is what we call them. And then we realized these therapists were putting a lot of effort into learning the device. And, you know, we, we had a very rigorous training protocol. And as we we're going, th- thinking about it, we realized, well, they're putting the effort, they're doing the work, let's certify them. And so I'm really proud to say we are the first company that came out with a certification program for physical therapists, occupational therapists, and we are also expanding to other areas where now they go through our program. We have some protocols. You'll have to take a quiz. You can be certified as a virtual reality physical therapist or occupational therapist. So it was a lot of iterative way and learning from our therapists, learning from our patients, getting their feedback. And I'm proud to say now we have a product that really can be used in the neuro setting, the orthopedic setting, and uh, just general physical therapy. Uh, and yeah, a little bit of pain, stress, and anxiety too. Okay, well, that was also uh, fantastic. As we said, it's three rock star companies. Um, it is so fabulous to be in this field of of uh, virtual reality. My initial exposure was at a serious games because that was mentioned was at a a serious games uh, conference where I got to try being in a glass elevator and also rehab with my eyes shooting at stars. So, um, as a digital health person, that fascinated me because I could see for the very first time, because this was before digital therapeutics, there was something digital that actually does something, and it's not just about making other things work better. So virtual reality is is fantastic. Um, and thank you to the audience for the kind words, and we're seeing all the questions. Now, we have one question since a patient asked this question. I'd like to get it out there right away, although I'm not sure you can really help, which is what do you do if you're a patient and you want to enter a clinical trial? I mean, I guess he could ask a healthcare professional around him 
he could write to the hospital that he might find on clinicaltrials.gov. Is there anything else that he or she could do? Who would like to answer that? I think uh, you you gave the right answer. Clinicaltrials.gov is the best place to see what clinical trials are going on and contact the people uh, that are working on it if you want to be part of their program. We've also had a lot of think about the universities that are around you because the one we work with almost all the universities, uh, uh, UT universities that are around us and they're always working on clinical trials, especially when they're trying to even use our system for a trial, they're looking for patients. So get in touch with them, get in touch with the kinesiology, the physical therapy department, the wellness department, pain, and I'm sure they will have something going on. Great, does anybody want to add to that? Otherwise, um, yeah, Jessica? I was just saying that covers it. Most of our the participants that are in our trials are in them because they're attending a facility that's taking the initiative to make the trial. So if you do attend a, uh, a facility, an outpatient center, I would talk to the director there because a lot of times they can also get grant funding for doing clinical trials. So there's always a physical therapist that loves research and data. So I would talk, classic answer, talk to your healthcare provider. Right. So we also have a, a physician, a pain physician at a hospital in New York City who wants to know about VR therapies for pain. Um, he has younger patients with nociplastic pain, meaning that you're not, we're not sure where that is coming from or why the person has pain. And um, he, he's talking about um, engagement. Um, so we, any of you could address uh, engagement once you have something that you want to propose. Maybe all three of you could speak about getting the patient engaged to use the, the program. Let's start with, with Caitlin, who was the first one to speak prior. It's Caitlin, engagement. This is great. I'm, I'm looking for the actual question to see how well, it's... Well, um, it's Rowan from Cornell. <laughs> okay, Rowan. Yeah, so... So I know for a fact that most there's a high level of recidivism, like a lot of people um, will drop out of programs because of lack of engagement. And I think that, you know, both Jessica and Vina were pointing to the same kind of symptom. It's also that the person who's experiencing um, some of these applications is not the person to introduce. So I'm big into the concept of mentoring. So sometimes if we think about uh, the VR experience, like a hero's journey, someone's crossing a threshold into the unknown world. And it's really hard to do that if you don't have an engaging human to acclimate you to both the device, the hardware, the setup, um, and to not feel like an object in the process. So I know in Get Trip, a lot of what we're focused on is both streamlining that friction you know, letting someone feel like they can acclimate and that they can slowly cross the threshold, understand, um, have a lot of the choices, whether they're choices in headset with experiences and what you can select and also have a person able to um, have some reflection involved, have some integration. Uh, to me, an experience with VR starts before I even put on a headset or before I press go and start. So a lot of the design for engagement is more than I would say the stereotype of thinking about action and wow, and you know things happening or things that you need to do right away. Um, I think it's also about the qualities that um, go back to a lot of design people in the field, um, even beyond VR. I know I used a lot of the tenets of Don Norman when I was doing my engagement design. Um, he talks about three levels of design, having it be um, behavioral, having it be visceral, and then having some level of reflective design in your process. So if I'm really trying to fine tune engagement, I'll say, well, behavior wise, what am I trying to have people do? And, and how will they feel invited to do that and to take agency? Because usually someone will come back if they feel recognized and given you know, some type of interaction in the experience. And then in terms of uh, visceral, then I'm just looking at the fact that we're animals, like our animal body. Is there anywhere where someone's going to have a visceral lift in the experience and they're going to feel something? Maybe it'll be a beautiful landscape. Um, maybe it'll be that the world 
actually has a, a little bit of a change in it where you have to subtly start noticing and heighten your awareness. Um, and then we can talk about gate theories of pain management and ways that when you build an environment, sometimes it's so interactive in that way that people are able to dial down on their, their pain perception. Um, so we could talk later about all of the, the studies and I find it fascinating how, how we have a certain amount of agency um, learning more about the language of our, our physical body. And then the reflective design is just, um, you know, that's something that different products and experiences do really well. Do I, do I actually feel like I belong in this experience so much so that anything that um, is put out among a suite, I could say, yeah, you know, this, this company really gets me. They know me. They have that reflective design down. Um, and sometimes you'll come into an experience, especially a trip, and it's so, it's so be beautiful and resonant that people say, I had a great time there. And I synced that with my perception, my brain, like, because I had a great experience, I want to come back again. And that kind of reflective design, um, that feeling of belonging is what we want to give to people when they can feel um, like they're not at their best otherwise, or they have some form of, it can feel like entrapment when you're um, suffering from something that is, is medical and, you know, has a longevity. So yeah, that's, that's my brief. So engagement answer. is is multifactorial. It's oh, yeah. um, the and humans it's around you. It's it's the uh, it's the device. It's the app. It's community. Yeah, um, and it's invitation yeah. for prescription. You have to invite somebody, not mandate. Like usually, it's not step 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 step. It's a path where there are some choices along the way. Yeah. Okay. And so um, engagement is the name of the game in rehab. Mm -hmm. So um, let's let's start with uh, Jessica. Yeah. So same addressing the same question, but it's about, about yeah. His in his case, it's pain patients, but just extracting from your experience about engagement. Yeah, and engagement is the biggest thing because I always say if you know any able-bodied person gets bored of going to the gym, okay, you might lose some muscle mass, you might put on a few pounds, but for somebody that's in rehab stopping going to therapy means losing independence, losing mobility. So how do you keep these, you know, pattern games and exercises interesting when you've been there for one week, six weeks, six months, six years? Um, and VR is a really, really powerful tool for that, especially, you know, I know the question before was more pediatric focused, especially in pediatrics, because you may be dealing with kids that have ADD and that person over there is on the piece of equipment or using the BOSU ball that I like to use. And then they're not focused on what their therapist is trying to get them to do. When you have the headset on, yes, it's that solitary experience and the fact that this is the environment that you're now in. But as Vina was saying too, the healthcare provider has that quality of intervention and the input to customize experiences for the person that they're working with. So it's not entirely solitary in that point, but the engagement factor just goes through the roof. Those self-imposed limitations, like for Eden, the first time that we had her try VR with us, she was doing an assisted crawling exercise, but she is five years, at the time, five years old, doesn't like to look like a baby crawling around. So she doesn't engage in the exercise. But when it became more of a game and less of a chore, she didn't even think about looking like a baby. She was trying to get the skateboard out from underneath the skater. So that engagement factor is huge. And Caitlin touched upon it. There's also the sensory gate theory that your brain can only process so many inputs at once. And pain perception is one of the first things that your brain pushes to the back burner. So when you have this flood of sensory input in a 360 degree environment with immersive audio and haptics, that pain perception is one of the first things that gets kicked to the back burner. And if you're not focused on the pain, what are you focused on? Well, the task at hand, whether that's, you know, collecting coins or sorting different colored objects or tracing or finding the audio cue to do a cervical neck rotation. Um, it makes just, instead of it being reps, it makes it a fun activity. So even with older populations, one of the first things we see when someone puts a headset on even if they're not enthusiastic about it because they don't identify as a gamer or a tech enthusiast, they sit up straight and they're excited to look around and see what's in there. So there's a lot of different ways that engagement really manifests when you're incorporating the technology. 
it's true. Uh, Caitlin had mentioned awe. There's a lot of awe and wonder when you put that headset on. So, Vina, there's a lot of pain in rehab. Um, do you find that pain, having pain itself engages them to continue so that they can try and manage that pain better? I mean, I resonate everything with everything Jessica said and also Caitlin said. We've had very similar experiences. And I think I'll go back to the neuroplasticity principles. You know, there are about 11 out there. And for pain, we've seen that giving them, you know, one, a little bit of a loose structure saying this is what you're going to do and this is how long it will take. And this is the exercise pattern. And then also task specificity, depending on what they're working on, which part of the body that they're working on, giving that specificity as to this is the task you will be doing and this is the goals that you will reach. And then that explicit and implicit feedback, giving them feedback as to how they did. So all of that will take away that pain. And we've had many pediatric patients and also uh, adult patients come in with, you know, knee pain, shoulder pain, and they don't want to do that therapy that day. They're, uh, they're not interested, but everybody's trying to push them through that one hour of therapy that they have to go through. And it's a chore. But as soon as you put the headset on, like the pain goes way back. And now they're working on their therapy and getting uh, working to make sure that they're reaching their goals. And I have one uh, quick example of a pediatric patient that we worked with. You know, this comes for pain and also the ADD part where, you know, kids get distracted really quickly. And then as being digital natives, they want something more interactive than passive viewing these days because they know everything. Like they know we are, like we don't have to tell them about it. So with this kid, she had uh, like a, you know, a tumor removed from her brainstem. So she had a lot of dizziness, she had pain, and the therapists were trying to get her to do at least five, to stand up for five minutes and do some work, but she was not able to because of her dizziness. She used to like, and uh, her cerebellum not working as it should. She used to like fall backward and overcorrect and fall, you know, uh, fall front and overcorrect and fall backwards. But as soon as we put the VR headset on her, she was standing straight because she was focused on what's happening in the environment and getting through those uh, tasks that, that were in the environment. It was phenomenal to see that because we were also at first scared about putting a VR headset on somebody who already has dizziness. We, we spoke to the physicians, told them exactly what we're doing. Like the therapist uh, got signed off from the physicians and we saw it was phenomenal to just see that happen. And, and she was engaged. She was very, very engaged. And our therapists have also used VR as a reward system. So with, when kids come in, they'll have to do stretching, they'll go through all of that. Again, therapy is a chore for them, but making VR a reward system, saying that you get to do 20 minutes of therapy with VR, if you get through all the stretching and everything else, they're much more engaged and you're still working on those functional tasks. Yeah, so, so that's um, fantastic. So I'm working my way through the questions and I realize as we're listening to how you feel when you put on the headset and we're all saying it, if anybody in the audience has not yet tried virtual reality in, in a headset, please have that be the next order of business on your to-do list because it will really open a world and you will understand what we've been talking about. And I understand that you aren't gonna necessarily acquire a headset before you try it. So you have to go somewhere either to a friend or go to a store or someplace where you can try it safely without having to invest. And then you will definitely want to get it. It's going to be the first step to the long path that all of these companies and myself have been on. So Jose Ferrer Costa wants to know if there is any line of therapy in, in VR directed to healthcare workers. And I think that Caitlin with TRIP has great possibilities for that. I feel like you're reading my mind. I was just there. I saw that you were about to write. Yes, I but I already had you in mind. I yeah. was thinking to Jose and, and others, Trip does have a line of programming. We're actually also uh, coming out with live programs that support the people who others. So Trip having programs, um, both for leadership training and also for people just to feel like they build their capacity and their resources. A lot of this is a combination of mindfulness training um, and really acclimating and team building in VR in ways that are engaging um, and supportive because people need wellness and well-being. And a lot of it is uh, treating a symptom and um, what we found is that a lot of people on these teams, they also want to be together in certain ways. 
So like I was mentioning, Trip has a certain suite of standalone experiences where you could have a solitary meditation, something that's really beautiful, um, either in the headset or um, using the app on your phone. And then uh, we're also rolling out programming where people can have empowering live sessions together, uh, where they have that community building, that engagement, um, and also that support structure for an industry that can feel really lonely um, and feel isolating. So uh, for groups, teams, you know, definitely, um, you know, there are ways to get in touch with me. I'm sure we can put our contact details. Yes, they can, uh, they can get in, in, in touch with you directly. I have to say, because there's another question, which is what programs do you recommend we tell patients about, that one of the purposes of VR for Health, and it's, it's not about doing a self-promotion, but it really is there for that purpose, is that the reason why we even started this is when you go out there and just type in virtual reality, and I'm sure many of the people in the audience are here because of that, you can get lost with all these basic articles telling you what it is and you don't know what, where to go and you don't know anything about the companies. And so on the directory that we have on our site, we give the opportunity to each of the partner companies to explain the nitty gritty about like any distinctions that they have and quality and how do they go after this and videos and demos and I know that some of the three of you, the three of you are on there, um, the companies, and you've put all your use cases. So um, it's really one way because it's hard for us to just say, you try one. In a, a question of ethics, we should say, do you try, you know, have a look at various, shop around and look at their scientific data, look at their results and their testimonials and, uh, and see what's up. But definitely for the whole wellness thing, the only person today is... Caitlin from, from TRIP, and they're certainly one of the longest on the market and have so much scientific data that not all companies do. And I run into a lot of hospitals and clinics that are offering um, virtual reality to their professionals first, because when they have that aha moment of putting on the headset, then they say, oh, I want this for my patients. I see that happen all the time at medical conferences. Yeah, that's a great place also to, to try them out. So. Um, Denise, I think what's the is, name yeah? of the website that you're talking about for the VR directory? Yeah, vrforhealth.com. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. so wonderful that you built that because otherwise I feel like we live in a world where there are a lot of buzzwords. And so right. if people have those buzzwords and they're just on Google trying to search for places. I think that's that's really hard. So to vet mm -hmm. and create, that's yeah bringing us together. Right, and so I, maybe I, Steve Patterson can put that into the general mm -hmm. chat when he has a chance. Yeah, so um, somebody named Helena Palau is asking about other AR VR devices used in the clinical setting in pediatrics that are not neuro. Where do you see that field going? Does anybody have a particular insight on that? When you say other AR VR, you mean not VR headsets and not augmented reality glasses, I guess. No. I don't I don't mind chiming in on this. I think there's sure. a lot of different ways that the technology is being applied as a whole. And I was just in Lisbon. Um, I know some of you on the panel were there. Denise, you were there. Um, and one of the questions um, at AWE and at the IVRA conference that we were talking about was, what is the metaverse? What is virtual reality versus augmented reality? There's a lot of different definitions. Um, as you were saying, if you Google it, you know, it depends what perspective it's coming from. Is it coming from the gaming side? Is it coming from the healthcare side? Is it coming from engineering? Um, you can have web-based applications that are virtual reality. And that's part of the challenge of actually also going through a lot of this existing research and seeing what are the definitions. Um, there's, there are different types of AR and VR, I'll call it applications, not devices, because device for me focuses more on the hardware and the hardware is always right. transitioning. She, and, and she yeah. did specify she's looking for the applications. She, she okay. wasn't looking for further devices, although they're out there at Apple and elsewhere trying to build them. They, they are. Um, you know, there's, there was one present, presenter at the International um, Virtual Reality Healthcare Association conference that was showing their case use of using VR and AR to help pinpoint exactly where tumors and um, essential anatomy features are in brain surgery. 
Um, you know, us on this panel here, we're more of the patient and personal focus where our applications are being put on the end user that is the patient or that is an individual. But there's a lot of behind the scenes science as well. You know, we've even created bespoke IP that is an augmented reality that helps, um, you know, specialized equipment so you don't have to flip through an owner's manual to figure out what to do. It recognizes, let's say, the, the lug nut on a wheel, and then you have these different options of what you could do to help solve your problem. So there's a lot of different ways that these applications are used. And then, of course, you could use that in you know, orthopedics. What is the bone supposed to look like versus what is the radiograph show that it looks like? Um, and there's a lot of companies that are starting to do these things. I think, you know, for our panel here, all of us seem to be taking a very holistic approach to VR. So, you know, how can we help people rehabilitate physically, rehabilitate mentally and emotionally? And all of those things do go hand in hand, whether you're wearing a device on your head or not. I'll just chime in with maybe a couple of use cases. One of the use cases that we do work with is kids on the autism spectrum. You know, they're working on uh, going through, you know, just everyday living activities, talking to people. And we have scenarios where they can go through a lunch line, learn how to actually go through one with the help of a teacher uh, being there. And then, uh, and also some social uh, social in interactions as to, you know, what if there's a bully and they want to take your food away, how do you respond to that? Or respond to a friendly person? And is there a way that does the kids show empathy or not? And is that something that they have to work on? And then we have like little features as money management where they'll have to actually pay for their food. So there's a lot of use cases in uh, that area of helping kids kind of just navigate through everyday living scenarios. And then there are companies that are working like uh, Jessica said, you know, education training. There are um, amazing companies out there. One of them is Prisons, uh, Prisons VR. They're working with K-12 education, bringing the 2D into 3D learning math, uh, you know, sciences in VR. So in pediatrics, there are a lot of companies that work on the needle phobia, and um, one of them, Smiley Scope, developed their own headset. I believe it's patented. It takes only a few seconds to put it on because that's a real problem in the throughput in a mm -hmm. hospital or, or a clinic. So Smiley Scope might be an interesting company to contact, also on the directory. And I want to shout out to Blessing Enough, who noticed that we were four women here. And thank you, Steve, for allowing us to be four women here when I uh, proposed that. We never discussed that it was that, but yes, there was a bit of intent there. I was not being egalitarian. So um, somebody is now saying that, uh, actually that was blessing. She's looking for more opportunities to learn. Gosh, there are so many webinars. I think if you type in webinar virtual reality, if you go onto YouTube, and I see that I'm gonna cut myself off because Caitlin wants to say something. Say something, Caitlin. Well, I have a I have a shout out and people have to be my hands, but I just happened to look up because I saw in the chat um, people mentioning Stanford, MIT. Thanks, Steve, for putting that in about um, hackathons. I've mentored the reality hack at MIT before, and that was really great. And I just happened to look. They're having one in January 2023, and the deadline to apply is by November 11th. So this is an activity. <laughs> Blessing, if you and others feel like getting on a team, what I liked about it is, um, you know, it, it kind of, there's gravity and there's levity. It's like we're trying to do great things that have great healing benefits and um, to have a sense of play and creativity and, and have people that are like-minded that all gather to these hubs. Um, I think it's really, really valuable. So um, I'm sure Stanford also has one coming up. Um, MIT's is in person, as far as I know. I'm not sure if you could be part of a remote team, but there are different ways. Like even just being here, you're maybe finding in the chat people who have like minds. Um, yeah, University of Washington, Seattle. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying some of these um, orchestrated events get people huddled around a table and you can intersect with people who have rich programming backgrounds and maybe you bring in a certain skill set and you start to see the map of what's possible and how people are um, approaching both design and application in a really streamlined way. And you get mentioned. I love hackathons. I took part in way too many and without any sleep because it, it's like a design course and a crash course as to learning exactly about VR, 
the idea that you go through and you form a team and you become lifelong friends with them at the end of the day. So I would definitely recommend that. Uh, I've done, you know, put up, uh, now I kind of help with hackathons with, there's a Texas healthcare challenge that happens actually here in Dallas with Health Wildcatters every year, and it's mostly focused on women. Uh, the last two years and helping them get SBA funds. So that's a good one to take look at and also help, you know, put on a hackathon for Blue Cross Blue Shield previously. And I love what you're saying. Uh, very good way to form that team. And some of these teams, I think PillPack actually came out of a hackathon right here in Health Wildcatters, and now they're sold for a billion dollars to Amazon, so anything can happen. Okay, that, those are all great things. I want to reassure the audience that we will stay here until 15 after the hour, no matter what your time zone. So that gives us another 18 minutes, and then we will stop. Um, so let's talk about headsets. There are a couple of questions from Emmy they Demi. Um, the challenges and successes with headset procurement, deployment, training, and maintenance, and any other devices that could be necessary. And do you think they have to have modified headsets for clinical use cases? I know that a lot of headsets for the trials would be just closed to only the application that is being studied. And the second thing we could say is true about all headsets is they all need to be cleaned. And so if they need to be cleaned, there are companies that do that, such as Cleanbox and Uvisan. Those are companies to look at on the directory. Okay. So who wants to talk headsets? I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 I love headsets. I love the hardware. And this was something that we decided early on is let the tech giants be the ones that are making the investments into hardware. But when you're starting a company and building a company, um, it's really important to have strong partnerships. So creating partnerships with healthcare providers, with research institutes, with hardware providers, because you can develop a phenomenal product, but you know the way that we approach it is in a hardware agnostic forum. So you can load Muron onto any of the major hardwares that exist and our input manager knows which one it's on and it adjusts accordingly. But you know the challenge with that is just like how it is with cell phones. Sometimes it feels like as soon as you start deploying a certain headset, all of a sudden the next generation one is available. You know, even we had the HP Omnicept for almost a year before it was deployed so that we could develop on it and give them feedback on it. Um, and then you're waiting for that to come out commercially. But by the time that one comes out commercially, there's other ones that have hit the market or that are upgrading to the next generation. So it's really important to have those relationships with the hardware companies that you can be developing for the next generation. Um, we even have worked with Google talking about accessibility features because, you know, if for me, I was an N64 kid, Nintendo kid all the way. If you put a PlayStation controller in my hand, I'm overwhelmed because there's so many different buttons. There's R1, R2, and what, I'm just about the joystick and two buttons. And it can be all overwhelming. Now imagine if you have limited dexterity and limited mobility, how much more overwhelming is that? So us as software developers, you know, we have to figure out which things we're keeping, which things we're going to disable, um, you know, even just the ergonomics of different headsets that come out. The Pico, for example, their Neo 2 had two like joysticks, the hand controllers that were kind of like hot dogs. I know that's not the best example, but they're just slim versus you have now their Neo 4, which um, looks a lot more like the VR hand controllers that you may traditionally see that have a sensor on the end plus the area that you hold in your hands. So there's different ergonomics. We 3D print accessories to go with them as well. So it is always a challenge. What's coming out? What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? Because that's the most important. And what I do love and successes that have come out is in the ergonomics. The headsets have become a lot lighter on your face. So for people that don't have the same mobility and strength in their neck, that's a big plus. Um, the hand controllers are sometimes not even needed anymore. So it's a fun challenge figuring out the hardware. I, okay. I think that Jessica should start maybe, I know you're very busy, but I was thinking maybe like an unboxing and reviews of upcoming things and just, just um, infusing the gameplay and the history. I mean, you had me at Nintendo 64 and... Um, <laughs> 
I too have a certain um, way that I like to work. And so when I'm leading a live session, for me, having controllers that are really wonderful, um, you know, that that means a lot to me. So sometimes I'll I'll mix and match and people don't know that behind the scenes. It's like um, trip is just easily available on the quest too. That's what most people choose, but they also go so far cross platform that people could come with different headsets. So usually um, because trip has made itself so widely available and accessible, our case would be that um, usually a research informed credible organization would come to us saying, we wanna run a study. These are the devices we have. And then we make it available on that platform with those devices. And I would say, you know, with users in mind, things accelerate so fast that you're right. Sometimes trials yeah. by the time they're completed and the hardware is outdated. It's, it's a tough kind of um, hurdle right now, I think, across the industry. Um, I would say it doesn't stop us from, you know, accelerating and keeping that, that adaptation, you know, mm -hmm. understanding what's quality in the experience and and certainly in the next few months we're just anticipating more is going to happen um more is going to be announced and and things are going to come out that have i i'm predicting a higher amount of um let's say biosensors in the equipment itself and that's exciting yes yes virtual reality opens a whole new world of possible measurement um, that will enable us to strengthen the correlations when you have the headset on and you see something or you're breathing, whatever it is, they can now multitask uh, measure, multi captors, multi sensors, and we will know so much more. It's, it's really, that's why I'm so excited, I've been so excited about it. It's, it's, it's the opening of a new world of healthcare. Uh, and medicine. And I want to take this advantage to thank all the people when writing in the chat. We are frustrated here because we can't write to you, but you can write to us. So that is Myron uh, and Sheridan. And thank you, Beth, uh, my partner, for putting the uh, the link uh, the link in there. So we have, um, I, we hopefully have covered the headset thing. I mean, it is a big deal to do like Smiley Scope, which is to go and create a whole new uh, method where um, apparently as the child is having feeling the needle, there's a choreography going on. So they're actually seeing matching um, imaginary visuals that will take them away from the thoughts about the pain. And there are various companies that are involved in, in just creating headsets for older people that are sort of like Viewmaster on steroids, where instead of looking at a flat picture of London Bridge, you're, you're in there um, and you can travel. So there's a lot of things yeah. out there for the people who can't get around. Yes, uh, I guess. Mina? I guess one last thing with is the industry is trying to work on it. That is the Open XR protocol that you know most company, all the big companies like you know Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Magic Leap, everybody is trying to create this interface uh, layers so that it it'd be much easier to be a hardware agnostic company. We went the other way and tried to be just on one headset just so that we have full control about the experiences because some of our experiences are very complex. And we saw that if there are many headsets, we have to make sure we maintain all of them. So what we do is we make it easy for the clinician. We will send you the device. We will show you how to sanitize it. We will do all that work for you. So all you have to concentrate on is treating the patient so that we kind of take a different approach. But as you know, the it's get better, you know, more biometrics come out. We, all of us as VR companies, will have to figure out what's the next headset that we're going to be on, what we're going to support. And that, that'll that be a never, I think, at least the five next five, 10 years will be a never ending thing that we have to keep doing. We just moved from, we've moved from so many headsets to, you know, like from the Neo, from the Neo 2 to Neo 3 now, and the 4 is coming out as soon as we had all of our, you know, customers on the Neo 3. So again, it's it's going to be a thing, but we're excited about the future. It's just getting smaller, faster, and better, and that's good for us as you know software developers of in the platform. Yes, it, that could be a whole session if Steve wants right. to invite yeah. back with other people about headsets. There are companies uh, out there. Um, two two other of our partners. There's um, Get Real who can help. Um, they're consultants in Chicago, but they could work anywhere. They can help organizations that don't know yet what their strategy needs to be about the headsets, about which software. So that's um, get real on the directory. We can and we bring our viewmasters and I have my DK1 and DK2. Uh -huh. 
and we have mace as well there there's oh yeah that's MACE true labs. they're specialists there in texas just like so many companies are and uh they're um, also able to procure whatever it is you need and explain to you about the about the maintenance and we're getting lots of thanks people have been enjoying this some people might be hopping off because we're beyond the um initial time but we have eight minutes left so um why don't you each tell us what are you the most proud about what makes you the most excited about each of your companies what's the most inspiring thing about the work that you've been doing in this in your company why should the people watching us be inspired okay let's start with maslin myron yeah, I'm what keeps me the most inspired and proud is when I really when I get to see the way that someone's day to day life is transformed. And I have an anecdote that I can give that's a good way to close it out. But at one of the facilities here in LA, um, we used to go in quite frequently pre COVID just see how they're doing, um, promoting them to use the headset in different ways with different patients. And there was an 18 year old there that had become a quadriplegic in a bicycle accident. And he had set really lofty goals for himself. He wasn't meeting his goals in the time frame that he set out for himself. And he stopped going to rehab. He was going three times a week and then he wasn't. And you know he wasn't even able to get dressed for himself and brush his teeth in the morning. But because he wasn't walking again right away, he thought, well, you know, he's depressed and what's the use? And when he started using Miron, he started going back into rehab two days a week, three days a week, becoming more engaged with his outcomes like we talked about earlier. And there was one time where we went back in and he was telling us about how it's very hard for him to activate his pectoral muscles. As soon as he feels the burn, oh, well, I did it, now I'm done. But when he was using VR, he was pushing way past the initial points of that burn because he wanted to get a high score, he wanted to finish the task at hand, he wanted to finish that game. And there was one day where we came back in and he was like, Jess, Josh, I could put a shirt on again for myself. And like, I get chills and teary eyed just thinking about that moment that a piece of technology was able to help him overcome some of his depression, overcome some of his hangups, reassess his goals and feel motivated to engage again and reach that huge life goal. And now it's on to the next goal. Um, we see it also with older populations with strokes where people say, I couldn't reach above this, but when they can't see their body in physical space, those self-imposed limitations are gone. And so that's really my favorite part. I love the science. I love collaborating with everyone in our industry and seeing how everyone is growing. But when you get to see that patient and how their day is changed, how their life is changed, that's the most, most powerful motivation that there is. Thank you. Okay, so quickly, let's go on to Vina and then Caitlin. Inspiration. Yeah, I think it's the same thing for us too. It's the impact that we are making on these patients that we are working at is what keeps us waking up every day and working on these companies. I think for us, it's been the same. We had a spinal cord injury patient, you know, 35 years old, is pretty young, and he all his goal was to be independent. And he learned how to like use, uh, you know, bend forward, pick up items, and put it back up in virtual reality. And one day came back and told me, you know, the first time he was able to pick up items from his pantry that has never been able to do that before. And that's his, that's how he's getting a little bit closer to independence. And recently, we've been concentrating on helping our physical therapists too, making sure that because, you know, everybody's shots there's you know staffing issues almost everywhere you know they're stressed they are they're, they're stretched in too with the amount of patients that they have to see and we had uh our home a uh, couple of our hospital systems that are using for home therapy come back and say you know now that they have a device that a creative tool that they can take with them and they don't have to come up they don't have to think as much as to like what do we do with this patient next one who's coming in and they don't have to put that much effort they just can pick an app from the uh our library and just use it with the patient and she said like after doing that for the couple of months that patient experience surveys were exponentially uh, had gone up and I have to ask her what that exponential number was it was great to see that that we are providing this efficiency we're taking you know providing this tool that so that they can do their job much better and provide that better outcomes for the patients too and so that's been it's good to know that we're helping someone with their job also. And a quick shout out before I give the, the word to Caitlin to uh, IVRHA, it was mentioned earlier, um, people are asking about events. Uh, Bob Fine is a uh, is big events guy 
for bringing together uh, the industry in physical events and sometimes such as with COVID in, uh, in long, lengthy voice breaking uh, conferences. So uh, thank you, Bob, because it was thanks to you that we got to meet in person with uh, uh, some of the people that we're seeing today. So Caitlin, inspiration. You've just changed jobs, so you must have been very inspired to do so to be with great people. I feel so inspired. I, I also, if you see me erupting in a smile, it's because I'm reading the chat and I'm saving the chat in lifetime. Um, and if Bob's in the audience in the chat, thank you as well. He, he is there. He, he said he was having his whole class watch us. Great times in community. So, take a so picture. I'm, yeah, I'm taking a picture. I'm saving the chat. If anyone wants to stay in touch, just put your, your contact in the chat. Um, this is I mean, this moment is awesome and inspiring when like minds come together. And I think just the the single stories, each person's story, I was just leaning into Jessica's story, Vina's story. When someone comes into an experience and they they leave with a greater sense of freedom or, you know, as simple as putting on a shirt, something we might take for granted, but it it does it, you know, there's there's no words for what we can do. Um Trip has testimonials on the page and I, I read them and I read some of the user feedback and realize that we've all been through a storm. The, the past few years have felt very isolating in certain ways. Um, and sometimes that's, that's not obvious at first, what people need, how they feel like maybe their well needs to be full or just a new practice that gives you a greater sense of dignity. Um, when I start to lead a meditation, I'm often saying to people, how do you put your body in a position where you embody dignity? Like, like how do you hold yourself? Um, and it's a choice for everybody about how to be in the world. And what motivates me is empowering meaningful human connection. So I'm using technology, um, but I don't relinquish my humanity. And so uh, for me, it's it's always inspiring to to see uh, an outcome that you can't predict, which is putting great people together, often in a virtual space, infuse some wonder and delight, and then see how that experience kind of unfolds into something where there's there's a collective um, kind of power to that human connection. Um, and people sometimes want that to be solitary and sometimes they want that to be in community. So I think amazing things have happened. Um, and, and recently, I think we've started to recontextualize even the word metaverse going beyond the shared spatial, you know, the, the basic definitions for the mechanics and bringing in more of what I would call the other S's, um, the storytelling, the somatic aspect in the body. Uh, the sensory details and the soulful qualities of, you know, who am I when I get to be in landscapes where I can be, um, you know, beyond maybe a literal concept of self, you know, what, what happens when you can embody uh, colors and sounds and sights in new ways. So I'm always inspired. And I, I found recently, you know, we built an experience that has to do with the overview effect and, um, I always wanted to be an astronaut when I was little. So my grandfather worked for NASA and we started out doing a lot of tinkering in the basement and playing around. And, um, you know, I feel like even though my eyesight wasn't good enough to become an astronaut, I feel like I can now because I can build things where we go into outer space and we look at planet Earth and we start to have that that feeling um, also of collective passion, which uh, is one of those overview effect uh, results. So for me, that's that's part of the benefit, part of the inspiration that we get to keep keep building these types of experiences that take people out of maybe what would be their expectation and into spaces that uh, provide more and so, better creative ideas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all yeah. of you. So to wrap up, I do have one very inspiring thing to say, which is that there is nothing that strikes me more than knowing that this can be used to facilitate labor, birth of a child. Whenever I tell people that they are amazed, but one day and hopefully one day soon, it will be common that during the labor portion, I'm not saying all the way up until the last minute, because maybe you want to have your eyes free to see the baby, um, 
that there are women who have already benefited from this and there could be a lot more if more people knew about it and said, we want this. There are studies. There's a great um, obstetrician, gynecologist obstetrician at, uh, at um, Cedar sinai who's done a lot of work, um, but Cedar sinai still has not integrated this into their um, birthing process. Hopefully it will. Um, I can't think of anything more inspiring than that, other than the fact that we've had so many thank yous and so many people wanting to share their emails in the chat and they will be able to. And I want to really very deeply thank Stephen Max Patterson for allowing us to come together and for organizing this. And uh, yes, some people are thanking him in the chat. So thank you all. It is dot 17 and we're going to have Stephen say the last word. Yeah, yeah. Well, for, first of all, uh, Denise, thank you for putting this together, uh, and Vina and Jessica and Caitlin uh, for for joining. Uh, this was a, a great talk that really added substance to uh, the 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 wellness and therapeutic um, aspect of um, medical XR. Um, a really really good talk, um, and I want to thank our audience for 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 attending um, uh, today. Uh, we have more talks coming up. Uh, this year, if you go to our uh, our website, um, uh, we have uh, Tumay Tanur, uh, who will be moderating. Um, uh, she's a kinesiologist and uh, uh, XR researcher uh, who will be moderating a talk on um, uh, building um, uh, solutions uh, for the commercial market uh, with uh, XR Help. In um, uh, then later in um, uh, in December. Uh, we'll have Roger Daglius, uh, who um, is a, um, uh, a trauma professor at, at Harvard Medical School, moderating a, a talk with um, uh, two uh, captain surgeons from the Navy uh, on um, uh, combat mentoring using um, AR, uh, which is a really interesting application. And going into the into the new year, uh, we'll have um, uh, the um, uh, 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 two talks, uh, one um, um, of the uh, Veterans Administration that's doing amazing things in, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with XR throughout their very large network. Uh, it's, a, it's a very impressive um, uh, talk. Um, uh, and I got to meet them thanks to, um, uh, to, to, to Bob Fine. Uh, 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 so thank you, Bob. Uh, Caitlin Rollins and Ann Bailey will, will, will join us. Uh, and then um, uh, something of a, what I call unicorns, uh, a talk, uh, Doctors Who Code. Uh, we'll have um, uh, 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 Bernard uh, uh, Francois, who um, is a uh, uh, game prototyper, uh, who's pretty, am pretty amazing. I, I think Caitlin might know him because she's smiling. Uh, and uh, Joe Morgan, who, um, who's an anesthesiologist who codes. Uh, and Omar Ali, who is a uh, colorectal surgeon, who, uh, who, who's, who's an amazing coder as well. And they're a real unicorn because they can build a prototype and hand it to a team to, to finish, uh, which is a, a wonderful dynamic. So on, on that note, um, again, I thank everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, uh, that was uh, uh, really wonderful uh, that, uh, that we were able to cover so much of, um, of, of this field. So thank you.